leading you on quite a journey through Luke of late, through several parables. And uh, last time I saw you, well, not saw you, but spoke to you, which was Sunday before last, I left you with just, well, I remember saying three more things, three more things. And uh, one of the last things I left you with was faith. Uh, One of the last stories that Jesus had told before we stopped. And then after Jesus talks about faith, then he walks into a parable. He leads us into a parable. And uh, it's an unusual parable too. Before we we actually read it, I want to say a few things about it. And that begins with, it's unique to Luke. It appears nowhere else. It's, It's not in Matthew, it's not in Mark. It's only in Luke's gospel. And um, it's been debate over whether all the verses really belong in there. Uh, Debate over what what the parable is really about. And I like that. I like that. It gives us something to think about. And when it seems to be an enigma in the, in the Bible, you can bet your, I don't know, Easter bonnet. You can bet your Easter bonnet that it's important. When I, when I uh, had the opportunity to study with Michael Segru, who used to teach at Princeton, I've told you before, he said the Bible is all music and no noise. Well, this parable, even though it doesn't appear anywhere else, is music. Even though we may say, I bet I don't understand the tune. It's music. Michael used to even say, the verse numbers can be important. as well as the chapter numbers, even though they were added later. Yes, they were a later edition. The the early manuscripts were not not separated into, into chapters and verses. But somebody did, and with an open consciousness, to Revelation. So, I like to think this is, this is one of those, those good parables. Uh, that we need to kind of latch on to. Um, I think it, we don't accomplish a whole lot in, in this life of spiritual growth, of constructing a solid spiritual consciousness until, until we're faithful to the principles we say that we believe. What do you think? Absolutely. Absolutely. I remember early days in Unity, I, I'd be in a class back in Cincinnati and, and I'd hear things that, oh, that was wonderful. And I'd remember those things. But I'm going to tell you, I didn't know what they meant, really. But I started accepting them with an idea of faith in them. So I began to accept them, believe in them, and it was a wonderful day when I began to use them. Hey, I came out of out of a confused religious family. Half of them were Roman Catholic and half were Presbyterian, and both sides hated the other. Each side thought the other one was wrong. I got to be baptized so many times. I've told you. I was baptized by the Presbyterian minister when I was an infant. And then the next time my Roman Catholic grandmother was babysitting, she was 
half a block from the Catholic Church. She dragged me up to that church and had the priest baptize me there. She knew that pagan thing across town didn't work. Oh. Our little town is about 8,000 people. The town, the politics were run by the church <laughs> and not the Presbyterian church. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. I wasn't raised Catholic. I was raised Presbyterian. So my Catholic playmates said, you're going to go to hell. I cried. I remember going in, in the house. My mother was in the kitchen, and I went, I'm going to go to hell. Oh, be still. <laughs> you know, mothers always have a way of saying, not to worry. <laughs> uh, but if we really believe, I told you the story of Ed Rabel being begged by students out at Unity some many years ago to teach an advanced class in metaphysics. So he set up a time and, and, and a room, and these people had been asking. They all came into the class, and they sat there eagerly awaiting Ed. And finally, Ed came in, and he stood at the little lectern at the front of the room, and he opened his notebook, and he said, if you would understand the advanced course in metaphysics, you would then just do it. Put it into action. Isn't that the, isn't that the advanced phase? Otherwise, it's all theory. Theory. So we've got to really have faith if, in, in what we believe in the truths that we know, in, in the teachings of Jesus, and then if you have faith, you will follow. If you don't have faith, you think those are just nice platitudes, and oh, that's a wonderful phrase. I should write that down so that I remember that. But it never touches your life. We accomplish little in constructing... A, in constructive living until we actually succeed being faithful to the principles that we say we believe. A little faith, if it is active, gives us a great deal of power to accomplish, to do things, to experience things. What you think about, we've heard about the mustard seed. If you have faith as a grain of mustard, well... A mustard seed moves the mountain only if it is alive and expanding. A dead mustard seed isn't going to do anything. Got to be alive within you. Joseph Fillmore, and I have this on the back of your bulletin if you care to look at that. It's the first quote from our archives. It comes from actually Unity Magazine, uh, volume 84, number five, page 47. You might want to go home and look that up, except you probably don't have that one at home. I think it's 1936. The approach to faith is by way of earnest, sincere work without other motive than to develop one's best self and gain a consciousness of the spiritual realities that interpenetrate life. Now the important piece there is earnest, sincere work without other motive. Oh, confession time. Father, forgive me for I have sinned. My first period in, in unity back in 1966, I took classes to learn how to get more. More money. How to have more stuff drop into my li life. I wasn't at any point thinking about, well, this is just to build consciousness. It's to get stuff. 
And that's what I thought it was all about. How to get more. How to have it all. Oh, boy. I can tell you the number of prosperity seminars I've seen over the years. <sighs> wow. I remember silver mind control. You remember hearing about silver mind control back in the 70s? 60s, 70s. Uh, I, I remember a woman at, at, at the church in Cincinnati. She couldn't wait to take it so she could control other people. <laughs> well, I suppose one. <laughs> you don't need silver mind control to do that. We, a lot of us do that pretty well. But it's about controlling our own thinking, our own attitudes, our own beliefs. To be clear channels of light and life and truth. <sighs> Sincere spiritual work without other motive. Thank you, Charles Fillmore. Have any of you found out it's, uh, it can be a challenge at times? Sure it is. When truth comes up against some error belief I, I have in consciousness or that you have, you may see a struggle. Or you may want to say, well, that's all a bunch of baloney. Because I know different. Releasing that human ego and releasing the cherished beliefs that are wrong is difficult. But then... Jesus comes along and tells us this wonderful parable. Would you like to read it? It's short. This is from Luke 17, and it begins in verse 8, 7. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say to him when he has come in from the field, come at once and sit down at table? Uh, any of you have a servant? Let's just kind of qualify it a little bit. If there was a rich man back in, the, in, in Jesus' time period and he had a servant, what's the servant there for? to serve, what is he provided for? He's provided for, he's paid to, to serve, yes? Some years, well, quite a number of years ago, I, uh, I remember being at one of the conferences when they awarded one of those, those association awards. I don't know whether it was the Charles Fillmore or whatever, but one of these awards to someone who had been paid for everything they did for unity. And I thought, but they were paid. That was their job. I like to think a reward and acknowledgement would be for something over and beyond what you're paid to do. Many times in school, I did just what was necessary to pass. I didn't get any of those, those beautiful glaring notes at the top of the page that said, beautifully done, thank you, I really enjoyed reading this. Unless I put more effort than the minimum into the paper. Got a few of those in ministerial school too. Wow. Wow. Lovely job, thank you, from one of the instructors. But I had to do more than just what was required to pass. That's true about life. Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and gird yourself and serve me till I eat and drink, and afterward you shall eat and drink? Then your work will be done, and it will be your turn. The order of things. Does he thank the servant because he did what was commanded? 
What do you think? Should he? Oh, thank you for doing what I hired you to do. You can say thank you, but that's, that was an agreed, that was a contract. I'll take care of you for this. I'll give you this. I'll, I'll pay for this. But this is what I expect. Oh, okay. It's a contract. I remember many, many years ago, well, back in the 60s, I told you about Marion, my, my, my friend who was the minister's secretary in Cincinnati. She had cats. And she said one day, I have a contract with my cats. Really? If I eat, they eat. You know, I remembered that. And later, when I had Cinderella, oh, you should have known Cinderella, 135 pounds of love my St. Bernard. I remembered that. And Cinderella and I had a contract. She gave me absolute unqualified love. Infinite love. And it was my job to take care of her. There were times where on the way home from work, I, I, when I worked for Baldwin, sometimes I, w I wouldn't get home until uh, 9.30 or quarter 10. And on the way home, I wouldn't stop anywhere. My contract? She's waiting for me to feed her, to go out. I've been able to eat and do anything other during the day I wanted to. She's been waiting. And that was the first thing. Sometimes I wanted to go out and visit friends, but I'd go home first. And I'd love up on Cinderella and feed her and let her out because that was the contract. Well, we're in this life for what? To see how much we can eat, drink, acquire, fill, how much we can fill our closets? Uh, I have a, I found a picture just last week. Uh, it's out of some of my mother's stuff. Uh, it was a picture of a mansion in Cincinnati. Uh, they had an auction there. The, the woman who was the last person to live in that house that time uh, passed, and they had an estate auction. My mother actually bought the, the piano out of there for me. <laughs> it was a six foot grand flame grain mahogany and on the picture of it, it that came out of the newspaper she had written the price down you ready? well you need some reference you may not have reference uh, that thing up there to replace today is $140,000. The price she wrote on that newspaper article, $160. I remember uh, I was walking home from school and she pulled up to the curb while I was on my way home and she said, get in the car. I said, what, what? She said, I bought something. I want you to see it and tell me if I did wrong. <laughs> she was going to run me over to where the auction was and show me the piano. It was a wonderful piano. But that house, you had to walk through channels because she kept everything. She was... She was trying to be the person who leaves here with the most, I suppose. That's not what it's about. It's about building your spiritual awareness and building 
a life out of that consciousness of being a beneficial presence in this world, of being of service. Do you ever walk around and, and give just because it, it's fun? I've had the opportunity to be in line at some grocery store and the person in front of me when it came to paying all of a sudden said, oh, I forgot my wallet. That's all right. How much is it? Okay. I paid for it. Because it was fun. It was a pleasure. I, just last week, I, I came out of a, uh, a fast food place, and uh, somebody outside said, Give me a piece of chicken. I said, I can't give you a piece of chicken. But here. Go buy a piece of chicken. It's, it's a real pleasure to do things like that. And not because it makes me feel like I'm such a good person, but because some part of me feels joy in doing. Being a beneficial presence. Just imagine, if all through life, all we did was what was required only what was necessary. Well, it's necessary to get up. It's necessary that I go to work. But it's done at five o'clock. At five o'clock, I'm out the door. Uh, we need you. To, I can't stay. Mm -mm, my day's over. See you tomorrow. Sometimes more is asked. But more importantly, even when it's not asked, when you see there's more to do and can say, let me help. How can I be of service? If we only do what is the minimum, the minimum necessary for life to be better, wait a minute, Jesus never talked about better. He talked about things like whole. To be whole and well. To be a fully functioning spiritual being. Well, thank you, Jesus. Uh, how do I do that? How do I do that? Well, if we only did what we did and what we do for what we get out of it personally, where's the benefit? Sometimes this parable is called the, well, I've called it uh, at times the, unsuccessful servant. There's some who call it the unprofitable servant. I kind of like that. What's profit? You acquire something. You sell it. The difference between what you sold it for and what you acquired it for is profit. If you only do give what's necessary, then there's no profit. It's 10 minus 10 equals Zero. Only doing what's required. At one point, remember Jesus talking about go the second mile? What are you, crazy? Why should I do that? My feet hurt. And besides, I, I, need to, I need to save my shoes. They may be the only ones I ever have. You go the second mile not for them, but for you, but for you. The ideal service, if I boil down what Jesus taught, is service without thought of return. 
If you happen to be in line at a supermarket or someplace and the person in front of you doesn't have enough money, if you choose to pay for it, are you then expecting to get back from that person? No, it's the universe that will take care of you. Trust, trust the inherent principle in this universe of the circulation of good. You give here, but you receive any place else. So often we, we demand even exchanges. Anybody remember those Christmases where you heard either a parent or somebody say, oh, well, um, what I got for so-and-so looks skimpy and they're gonna give me more than that and I better get something else. And my mother would worry that everything looked equal and that everybody was gonna get an equal amount to what she expected her family to get. It was more like bribery. <laughs> Or it's really buying your own Christmas presents, isn't it? At one point I said, why don't we just, at Christmas time, buy ourselves what we want, then all get together and show each other what we bought ourselves. <laughs> Everybody's happy, there are no returns, and nobody got shorted. You know, gee, Grandma, Thanks for the pin cushion. It's just what I wanted, but not very much. You put it into the universe. That's where you're putting it, into the universe. Uh, we've got to do more than even exchanges. No more eye for eye, tooth for tooth. We give because we are enriched. The, the unprofitable servant only does what is required, his duty and no more. The second mile, don't be silly. It seems so foolish. How impractical. There are three things that I think are important. Faith, service, and gratitude. Now, we know about faith. We know how important faith is. We know that we've always got faith, right? You don't have to pray for more faith. You've got it. But what you need to pray about is the guidance of where to put it because we're always investing it either in the presence of God or the absence of God. The presence of good or the absence of good. We want to always place it in the concept of the presence of infinite good. On the back of the bulletin, once again, from the, from the same Unity magazine from 1936, gratitude is the spiritual quality that corresponds to appropriation on the physical plane. <sighs> gratitude, appropriation is, I get to appropriate, to accept, to, to be fulfilled. Gratitude is what brings it to us. On the lowest level, appropriation is selfish grasping. Raised to its highest, it becomes thanksgiving for all good, even before the good begins to be manifested. Thank you, Father, that you hear me now. I know you hear me always. Remember Jesus' words? He gave thanks even before he fed the 5,000. I'm sure people were off on the side saying, yeah, he's, he's given thanks for feeding all of us, and he's got what? A few loaves of bread and a couple of fish? 5,000? Impossible. What kind of fool is this? Ah, thank you, Father. And Lazarus came forth, giving thanks first because your faith sees that it's already done. Faith, 
service gratitude. Faith in the Christ way. Faith in the principles that Jesus taught. Faith enough to do them, to be them, to live them, and then service to that way. And that means to other Christed individuals in this world who are at some level asking someone to please recognize that divinity in them. Will you do that? And then blessings for the uh, gratitude for the blessings that come as a result of your doing. It happens. You can't do good without receiving good. You cannot be kind without getting kindness from someplace else in this universe, but it comes. Remember, what you give, you get. It's the law. Break it and I'll give you a ticket. You can do it. Put on those walking shoes. Not just what's required, but what the spirit within you inspires you to do. And then you can let go and let God do the good through you. And who gets blessed first? The approach to faith is by way of earnest, sincere work without other motive. You don't do it to get the good, but you get the good because it's the law. 